part of loving God with all your being. It's the greatest thing in your life. It's, it's bigger than being a part of a church as a member. It's even bigger than doing something for the church. It's a matter of who you are. Jesus said, the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with all your being. That's about worship. And it's all the way throughout Scripture. And if you want to look at one of, if we can call it this, a song or devotion book, there's 150 of them called Psalms that are right in the middle of the Bible. And I want you to be able to today, if we can, to turn to Psalm 100, and let's take a look and see what a heart of worship is all about. Can we do that for about 15, 20 minutes? Is that okay? Psalm 100 begins this way, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, not whimper, not come in on your hands, not be timid, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, worship the Lord, worship the Lord with gladness, not worship your job, not worship even your family not worship the material things of your life. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. We come, there are what they call psalms of ascent, and actually the psalms where the people would sing as they are coming in to Jerusalem to the temple. And worship is about coming before him with joyful songs. Matt Redman, who I'm going to reference later in the message, gives us a very good description of what worship is. It's the people of God in the presence of God pouring out the praises of God. The people in the presence bringing praises before God. And I hope as you become more familiar with this in the next couple of minutes, you'll begin to understand a certain perspective that I want you to catch. The people of God in the presence of God pouring forth the praises of God. Why do we worship? Because it's of who God is. He's worthy of all of our praise. Psalm 100 continues in verse 3, gives us the reason why. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are the people of his pasture. We are his people, the people of his pasture. It's this world, and if you don't watch out, will turn you upside down, spin you out like you're going through a spin cycle in your washer. It is set about knowing that you are the center of your life. Be who you want to be. Even define your own truth. Live your life. Be the people you want to be. And the Bible says you're not your own. That there is a good and loving God who knows you and you are his. And we are to come and bring adoration and praise to the one who gave us life, who sustains us who knows us like a shepherd knows his sheep and enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. Here's the reason why, because he created us. He created, a good and loving God created you. The Bible says he created our inmost being that while we were being formed in our mother's womb, the Lord was having general watch care and oversight. Yes, your parents procreated you, but the Lord was behind it all. He created us. We're his. He knows us. He knows that we need worship, and he knows that we need to worship him to find our meaning and hope in life. That's what worship is about. The source of our contentment is outside of ourselves. If you try to find your your source of contentment within you, you'll be enslaving 
just like this world is to itself. But worship says, I'm going to find my source of help and strength and contentment in the one who made me. Yes, I'm willing to admit I've been made by a loving God, and I need him, and I need to give him the worship I need, because when I worship him, I found out what my purpose is all about. We okay with that? Worship begins with thanksgiving. Notice how he says over and over again, enter with thanksgiving. Sometimes it's hard to be thankful, and I need worship then more than I do ever. But you know what happens when you come and you are able to say, thank you, Lord, even for the smallest thing, you begin just like someone rolls a small ball of snow. You begin then to understand, man, I got so much more to be thankful for as well. I just want you to be thinking about that in your own life. What is it even this week that you could come into the house of the Lord and say, I'm thankful for? All this other stuff may suck, but if I'm really attentive to my life, Lord, thank you for being with me here. Thank you for providing this. Thank you for just doing it. See, sometimes we even forget. Some of the needs and some of the issues of my life, the Lord's answered, and we're not even perceptive to say, Lord, you have been with me. Can you just take a moment and just stop and say to yourself, yeah. I mean, it could be an ache. Trust me, as I get older, sometimes the aches are like, Lord, help me. And then if you don't watch out, it's like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me a good life. Thank you for helping me. I looked at this issue in my life, and we forget. We forget, don't we? And we need to stop and say, oh, help me to remember the blessings and the goodness. And that's what worship does. It helps us to focus our attention on the Lord, and then we begin to understand all the things that we can be thankful for. And if you're in the midst of a valley today, don't settle for grumpiness and bitterness. Don't allow yourself to become an ungrateful person. You've got too much to be thankful for in your life. I'm not trying to say that life doesn't come with deep heartaches. Please, hear me on this. But I also want to tell you that you and I can be thankful for the things that we know God has given us in our life, and we need to stop and remember and rehearse the goodness of God in our life. Amen to that, everybody? Why can we have thanksgiving despite the issues of our life? Psalm 100, verse 5. Look there, verse 5. For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. God described that way, helps us to understand, you have been good to me. There have been heartaches and pains and things See, I'm talking to a young person here who looks at life and says, I don't know the answer to this. You may not know the answer right away, but I would encourage you to continue to worship God, and you'll begin to see that some of the question marks that you and I have in our own mind about things in life will be able to see that nonetheless, God is still good, that God worked through some of those things that brought the questions in our life, and we'll be able to see the Lord really is good. The Lord is good, regardless of what we see, and I can't make sense, the Lord's still good. He is worthy, his love endures forever, his faithfulness continues for a time and for his, no, that's, what's it say? The faithfulness of the Lord continues throughout all generations. He never stops his faithfulness to us. Where is God in your life? He is faithful to be in your life. If you don't know him, he is pursuing you. If you know him, he is with you. He's helping you through the issues of your life. That's who God is. And similarly, this happens all the way throughout many of the Psalms. We're in Psalm 100. You don't have to turn, but let's look at Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, then I'm going to turn to verse 13. The Lord is gracious. We have this mistaken idea that God is a God of law in the Old Testament. God's a God of great. My word. He's a God of grace in the Old Testament as well. And the people of God said, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. 
and rich in love. Yes, he does get angry sometimes, but it's slow. And it's only our disobedience. Any parent can tell you that. I don't want my parent to be angry with me. Well, you, you should be glad because it comes from a heart of love who's willing to say, because I love you so much, I'm willing that that arouses my anger because I love you so much, I don't want to see you go off the pitfalls of life. If you have a parent in your life, who, who knows this one? My parent was such a pain in the you-know-what when I was growing up. But I am so thankful that my parent was being willing. Because you know what? If it wasn't for a kind and praying and caring parent, I don't know where I would be in my life. Amen to that one? It's the same way with God. He's slow to anger. He loves us. And sometimes if we go off the deep path, his anger is aroused because he's not just looking to punish you. He loves you so much he doesn't want to see what sin does in our life. That brings his anger. The Lord's good to some people. That's not what it says, does it? The Lord is good to all. That's who God is. He has compassion on some of the people he's made. No, that's not what it says. The Lord has compassion on all he has made, people, his creation. Look what it says in verse 13. Your kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. John Lennon, when they came as part of the Beatles, 19, I think it's 1963, 1962, three or four, said, we're bigger than Jesus right now. Well, they, they might have been for a season. You understand my point? But like everything, we all die. But you say amen to this. The Lord is the bedrock of all life. Amen to that? He will never leave you. He will never change. He is his power and rule will never end. And friend, one day you'll want to know that. Because as you grow older, you want to know something that really matters in your life. God is the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion, your rule endures throughout all generations. The Lord is trustworthy. See, here we are. We can trust the Lord and all his promises, and he's faithful. He may not look faithful right now in your life, but he is. And he's working in these circumstances because he is trustworthy and he's faithful. Amen to that? That's the character of God. That's why we can praise and come into this place of worship and say, I'm going to praise God no matter what, because we can trust his character. He's good. He's faithful. There will never be a time when he doesn't love us. Matter of fact, he's faithful even when we aren't faithful. Aren't you thankful for that? Lord, I just botched the whole thing up. Okay, the Lord's still faithful. I don't know what's going on in my life. The Lord is still faithful. His rule will never end. So the result of worship is this. Worship ushers in the king. It reminds us of his character. Don't you need to be reminded the Lord's faithful, the Lord's good, the Lord's still working? I mean, let's face it, life is rough. And when you and I come into worship, it helps us to know, <laughs> Lord, I've got so much to be thankful for because no matter what happens in this world, you are true and good and kind and faithful to everything you've promised. Amen to that? See, Jesus comes on the scene, and he knows his Hebrew Bible. We are the people of his pasture. He knew Psalm 100. We are his, the people of his pasture, the sheep of his pasture. What does Jesus say? John records Jesus saying this to his people. And won't you turn there with me because this is an important thing. It's bold of Jesus to say this, but this is exactly what he says. Turn with me to the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 10. 
And he makes this bold statement right here, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. All the character traits that you saw in Psalms, good, faithful, trustworthy. Jesus says, pick them up on me. That's exactly who I am. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen yet, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. What's he pointing to? His resurrection. Jesus lives. He's the great shepherd. Today, Jesus is the great shepherd. You can trust him. And look what he says in verse 18. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, authority to take it up. This command I receive from my Father. When those Romans and religious leaders thought they were putting Jesus to death, now we got him. Jesus was saying, you don't have me. I'm willing to give my life for you. There's a big difference, isn't it? Have you ever heard the old gospel song, 10,000 angels? I could have called 10,000 angels. No one took Jesus' life. He was willing to give his life for us. Amen to that? Because he is the good shepherd. And he wants to lead us and for us to follow. And he hears our voice. We know him. He loves us so much he's willing to give himself. What's he say? The hired hand, he don't care. When the predators come, have at it. I don't care. They're not mine. No, no, that's not Jesus' way. These sheep are so valuable to me, I'll lay down my life for these people. That's the way Jesus is with you and I. You need to be reminded of that this morning. Jesus loves each one of us enough that he will lay down his life in protection of your life. That's why we should come into this worship service and say, oh, Lord, whether I feel it or not, whether it's been a good week or not, Jesus, you are worthy of my praise. Amen? Are you catching the major point to my message? You may say, Sean, if you had made it more clear, you wouldn't have to tell us what it is. But worship has nothing to do with you and me. Worship is coming in this place and saying, it is all about you, Jesus. Amen to that? I didn't come because I had a bad week. I really feel bad today, so I'm not. You see all how all that pales in comparison to saying, whether you've had a good week or not, whether you want to come or not, can I tell you as your pastor, there are some Sundays, this is the last place I want to be. I mean, if I just follow my emotions, because it's been a rough week, let me just curl up in bed. But Jesus is bigger than curling up in bed. Jesus is bigger than a bad week. Jesus is bigger than even medical professionals. He's bigger than what your friends may tell you or that you think about yourself. He is worthy of our praise regardless of what's happening in our life. Amen to that? Jesus' rule will never end. He is the Lord of life. One day we will see him face to face. And I just pray today that you would say to yourself, that's what worship is. Worship is ascribing to Jesus all that he is, all that he's done, all that he has promised to us, and all that he will do one day for us. This world will pass away. Jesus will never. And he's faithful and good to us. He loves us. I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes you and I aren't lovable. Jesus says, 
That doesn't bother me one bit. I have made a commitment to you, and I'm going to see it through. Yes, you are worth loving. Yes, you are worth something in your life, and I'm going to bring it out in your life. See, you see how important it is for us to come and say, that's why we worship right here. That's why we come into this place. It has nothing to do with you and me. This is the last night I said, when we worship, we lift up the person of Jesus. He is God-made flesh. He is the most magnificent human being that has ever lived. He has done for us what no other person could ever do in our life. So when we come into worship, we lift up the person of Jesus. We lift up the work of Jesus, what he has done for us. And we also come and say, we want to worship the rule of Jesus. This world may have all kind of kings and queens, but for Christians, you come into worship and you say this, Jesus is my king. And we should be good. We've talked about it for a week now. Quite frankly, many of us are more identified by our political party than our identity with the king. We should pray for our president. We should pray for our local leaders. But for Christians, we say, we want to do our due honor, care for, and pray for our people. You say amen to this. As a Christian, my allegiance is to King Jesus. Amen to that? There's no political party that holds all of Jesus. Jesus is the true king of my life. Amen to that? And we come into this worship service and we say to ourselves, I don't care who says they're the king. <laughs> there ain't no bigger than King Jesus. And I come into this worship service and I stand and say, Lord Jesus, you are the true king of this world. And one day all the kingdoms of this world will be sucked up into your kingdom and you will be the rightful reigning king of all of life. Amen to that? I'm only giving to Jesus what he already is. And one day we will see King Jesus and we'll be able to say, Lord, I worship you. This person, this person might have been in rain. Uh, I was always waiting for you, Jesus. And I worship you every week, every day, because I know you're the rightful king of this world. Matt Redman, who I quoted earlier, he began as a worship leader in the United Kingdom, in England. And he was the worship leader for a pastor. And I won't go into all the great detail, but the pastor started to feel like the church was hiding behind the lights and the sound system and the production of their worship services. And the pastor said this, we're not going to meet in the sanctuary where all the lights and the great sound system and all of us. We're going to go to this room and we're going to unplug everything and we're going to come and we're just going to sing with our voices. And Matt Redmond said, I was a young worship pastor and that shook me to the core because it dealt with my identity. What, what am I to do now? Because everything was stripped away and what, what do you want me to do? And he said it was a really tough time for him because his identity was in how the music sounded, how the mood was set, if everything sounded good. And he said he went home and he sat down and he just, this song wasn't even written to be something that was brought to the public. When the music fades, and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, right? Because a song in itself will never be enough. I'll bring you my heart. And Matt said, from that on, 
They spent several months just simply with their voice and with their time saying, it's all about you, Jesus. Now, I want to have mighty music in this church. If you play any instruments, let Bailey know. But if we ever start to hide behind a guitar or drums or lights or video screens, and we leave and go, man, wasn't that a great service? I just love that. We don't say, man, wasn't it great to worship King Jesus? We have failed. We failed. It's all about Jesus. Amen to that. I'm coming back to a heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. That song was written in 1999, almost 25 years ago. And most of us would say, I love this song because it helps me to see the heart of worship. Amen to that. Friend, I don't care who, what position you hold. I don't care how much money you have in your bank. I don't care what you do. I don't care who you're associated with. All that will fade, but the praises of King Jesus will never fade. And I would ask that you'll become part of the King Jesus people and say, Lord, here I am. I want to tell you I'm thankful for who you are and everything is about you in my life. Amen to that? Stand to our feet. Let's sing it unto the Lord today. From a heart that understands the Lord is good, amen? The Lord is trustworthy and true. He loves us. He is faithful through all generations. Jesus is worthy to be praised today, amen? Mm-hmm.